And uh, Jason, uh, the reporter there, joins me now. And uh, Jason, well, I've got to say, it's one of the most powerful pieces of reporting uh, in this pandemic. Just give us a sense of the intensity you found in there. What struck you about being in there? I think the first thing you notice is people's faces, the patients. Um, obviously, they're the only people's faces you can see because everyone else is masked up. And it's one of the things that we don't really show you because um, we can't get consent and it's very distressing to see people there. Are, sometimes their eyes are open, but they can't really, they're not really seeing, if, if you know what I mean. Sometimes their eyes are closed and they're, they're just covered in tubes in their mouths. Sometimes there's a tracheotomy in, in the neck uh, to support their breathing. And they all look like they're gasping for breath because if it weren't for the machines, they wouldn't be alive. Um, it's different in different areas. So there might be an ICU ward which is very well set up and everything's spaced out. And in other areas where they've had to adapt a ward, uh, there might be, it might be a bit more cramped. And my, my cameraman, Andy Porch, described it as, a, as, a, as like a field hospital. Uh, not, he's been in one, uh, so he, he, he should know, but not because of the lack, not because of, the lack of technology, because that's definitely there, but just the atmosphere and the feel of people mucking in. Some of the rooms are quite hot feels very hot in the PPE. And one of the things that really struck me going there was when I've been to hospitals before, it's often been with a politician uh, on a campaign trail or something like that, and everything is very staged managed. Um, and you're told where to point the camera and who to speak to. They just don't have time for any of that. It's, it's, it's everyone's mucking in. Uh, you, you saw from the report, people from all over the hospital coming in to, to bring in their specialities. Uh, there's no such thing as a comfort zone for anybody. Uh, because even if they're in that speciality, they're in very different kit from what they're used to. Um, and the other thing, uh, of, of course, is that there are people there who are not in their specialities, and you'll have consultants acting as nurses. And, you know, we heard from Matt Hancock that there are 37,000 people now in the UK hospitals. There are obviously uh, a lot of people. Uh, there's not more, more, a lot more than they used to. Um, the more than ever in this pandemic on, on ventilators. And we have enough ventilators, but you've got to think of the, the amount of time it takes and the amount of care for people to keep those ventilators functioning and the, and the people on them. You know, their eyes, uh, they need uh, moisturising. Um, they, they need the, the tubes clear, clearing. They need the machines monitoring. So that all of that is going on, and that requires people, and they are tremendously dedicated. And, uh, Jason, it's pretty rare, I think, that we would run an interview of someone who subsequently passed away. But uh, Tony's widow, Linda, you say, wanted this show. Yeah, thoughts again with uh, Tony and uh, his family and his widow, Linda. He clearly thought about her an awful lot in, in those last moments. And um, it was just by chance that I happened to walk into his world on his, on his last day, a full day, um, alive. And we did the interview, and he was actually on, his, on the phone to his wife afterwards, and so we got his consent, and then um, he, he spoke to his wife about it. And I just called, as I was editing it, um, he'd given me his wife's number, and I called her up just to make sure that she was okay with it. It was only then, well, whilst I was editing the piece, that uh, she told me that he had passed away. So, I, I, you know, I... Um, I made sure that she was okay with us using the interview, and she said if he wanted to do it, then 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 I want you know I want it to go out. Um, and I spoke to her today. She hasn't watched it. Um, she thought it would be too traumatic, but members of her family have, and she's very pleased uh, that he's done it. She said he always wanted his 15 minutes of fame, um, and uh, she was pleased that he put that message out there um, about people staying safe. And I think she's very happy that he, his 15 minutes of fame were well used. Yeah. And, uh, Jason, I mean, you'll be doing some more reporting from this hospital. And I assume the staff pretty keen to get out their uh, message as well. Yeah, I mean, that comes across, doesn't it? Each and every one of them are just hoping that... It, we're, we're living in two different worlds, really, aren't we? There's, there's the world outside of these hospitals where everyone's getting extremely frustrated and we all are. Uh, the restrictions uh, and the social distancing and not being able to see loved ones. And then there's a complete... And those people live in that, that world as well. Uh, they don't get much time in it, but they, they do live in it. And, and they understand. But um, when you step into their world uh, and you see what they're going through, and we'll continue to do that, because I think it's important now that journalists are you know, embedded 
in a way, as we, we just sometimes are with the military when we're in a camp, military campaign. I think we have to be embedded with uh, these, um, peop- uh, th- these medics, you know, to see what they're going through and to give the public a window into their worlds. Okay, Jason, um, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.